Thank you, everyone. So as he said, I'm Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I do also work for Mozilla. And of course, at Mozilla, we do make the Firefox browser. But we've also worked on a number of other browsers. Uh, there's one called Servo. How many of you have heard of Servo before? OK, we have a couple of hands out there. Um, that is a really cool new browser being worked on in the programming language Rust. And it's really fast. So uh, if you like future technology, I really uh, recommend checking out Servo. Uh, and then we, we're working on this other browser uh, called Dofino that was built with React. And I was helping out with that one and hacking on it. And of course, performance is really important when you're working on browsers. So I figured, as long as I was hacking on this browser, I should really dig into React and figure out the nitty gritty details, the internals, figure out how those work so that I could be more effective at building this browser. So that meant that I had to step through React's internals over and over and over and over again. And I figured as long as I had gone through that process, I might as well write it down and draw it out in cartoons so that you all could get the benefit of it without having to spend the time doing that. So that's what this is. And I'm going to be focusing, as I said, on performance. And I should start by saying I'm not going to be telling you anything that you haven't heard before. I'm going to be talking about things like keys and immutability and should component update. The reason that I wanted to talk about them, though, is because I think that a lot of times we have this kind of fuzzy understanding of the concepts around performance, and we don't really take the time to bring them into focus. So this means that we treat any knowledge about performance in something like React as received knowledge. You know, we just add a should component update to our components because somebody on a stage told us that that was the right thing to do. But not all recommendations work in all situations. And so that's why I wanted to bring the concepts around performance into focus so that you would have a better understanding when you're applying these recommendations of why you're doing it and what impacts they might have. And so I should also say that I'm focusing on a very specific part of performance in React. So I'm talking about the performance of the render cycle. Now, there are lots of other factors that will affect performance in React. One of the biggest ones is actually making sure that you're using the production version of React when you're in production. Uh, the development version of React has a lot of extra stuff that it does, which can slow down your app. So uh, that's a big one. There are other big ones like that. I'm not going to be talking about those. So this talk is going to go a little something like this. First, I'm going to talk about the basics of how the browser actually renders your web page and what can be potentially slow there. And then I'm going to talk about how React minimizes and batches DOM changes, some of the things that can kind of make things slow, with the virtual DOM. And then I'm going to talk about what on top of that you can do to make things faster. So first, let's start with one, the basics of rendering in the browser. So I'm going to be talking about how the browser builds your web page. And you can kind of think about how the browser builds your web page in the same way that you think about when you're building your web page, when you're actually developing the web page. You know, it's work that takes place over time. And there's a first, first part of work uh, in React. This is the initial render. When you're developing a site, this is going to be the time up to launch. And then you have these subsequent updates. Now, to extend this metaphor, your code is actually kind of like the project lead on this project. Your code is planning the project, and it's telling folks what to do. Now, unfortunately, your code only has one person working on the team with it who's actually doing this work. And that's the main thread. So the main thread, I think of the main thread as kind of like a full stack developer. The main thread's in charge of JavaScript, the DOM, and layout. And just as when you're working on a project in real life, if you only have one person that's doing the actual work, you're going to figure out what your scope is. You're going to need to try and reduce your scope, reduce the amount of work that you're loading onto this one person working for you. But before you know how to reduce the amount of work that the main thread has to do, you have to know more about what, the work, what work the main thread is doing. So as I mentioned before, the main thread is in charge of JavaScript, the DOM, and layout. So JavaScript, you know, that's your code. That's where you're calling functions and defining functions. The DOM is the way that the functions can tell the page what to do. 
So the base, basically what the DOM does is it gives you a set of objects, and you can change properties on those objects and move them around in relationship to, uh, to each other, and that will actually tell the browser to show something different. The way that this works is that there's something behind the scenes called the render tree. So the main thread combines the DOM and CSS to create the render tree, and it figures out this thing from there, which it passes off to the thing that actually paints the, browser, uh, paints the pixels on the page. And this process is called a reflow, and that computation takes a bit of time. So the main thread doesn't actually go through the process of figuring out this render tree every single time that the DOM changes. Instead, you know, because if it would, it would be spending all of its time doing this layout, figuring out this new render tree. So instead, what it tries to do is batch as many of these changes together as possible. So let's say that our code wants to change a class name on a button. So it would tell the main thread to do that, and then it would say add a div, and the main thread would do that, and then add another button. And the main thread would keep going to the DOM tree and making these changes to the DOM tree without actually recalculating the render tree. But what it would have done is when it started this process, it would say, okay, in the future, I need to recalculate the render tree. It would schedule an update to the render tree. So once that scheduled recalculation once, the, once that time happened, it would go over to the render tree and actually make those changes all together. So we want to reduce the amount of work that the main thread has to do. And if you were watching this, you might have had two ideas for how we could reduce the work. So one would be we could reduce the number of changes that we need to make to the DOM. And another would be that if we do have to make changes, we could batch them together in time so that it makes it easier for the main thread to batch its changes to the render tree. And this is something that React helps you do. Now, I want to be clear, React is not the only way to do this. It's not even the first thing, the first, uh, the developers of React were not the first to figure out that this is a way to speed up apps. This was already an established part of web development best practices before React came around. So you could get as good or better performance with Vanilla.js as you could with React. It's not necessarily that React is faster than Vanilla. The thing is, though, in order to get that performance, your code has to be smart. So your developers have to know about these principles, and they have to be pretty consistent in applying them. To go back to the metaphor, your code needs to be both a really, really good product manager, it needs to know what needs to be shipped to the user, and it also needs to be a really, really good tech lead. It needs to know the most efficient way in shipping this thing. So as I was talking about, of course, your code is only as smart as your developers. So that, this means that all of your developers on the team have to know about these best practices and also not make mistakes too often. So what React does for you is it offloads this work. It's kind of like your code hires a consultant tech lead. And this is going to free up your code just to be a really good product manager, just to know what should be shipped to the user, not to have to worry about the details of how it's actually shipped, the details of telling the main thread the most efficient way of shipping. So let's take a look at how these two, React and your code, work together to direct the main thread. And I'm not going to be showing you the main thread throughout the rest of the slides, but you can assume wherever work is happening, the main thread is involved in that. So this brings us to part two, how React minimizes and uh, batches DOM changes using the virtual DOM. So we're going to walk through an example, and I'm going to start with a really basic web page. This web page, if you click the button, it's just going to square the number, so it's going to multiply each number by itself. So let's walk through the initial render of this. And I'm going to start from the very, very, very beginning. A user has downloaded your web page, the HTML has been parsed, and there's an element which React, you're going to put your React app into. This is called the container of the React app. And your code has been loaded, and React has been loaded, and along with your code, these things called components have been loaded. So those are basically like deputy product managers. Uh, they know what specific parts of the page should show. And so if this doesn't sound familiar, 
the code that we're actually talking about here is reactdom.render. So we're going to start rendering a React app. And we pass in the React element, list in this case, and the container that we want to render into. So we already talked about that container, but we haven't talked about what a React element is. So let's talk a little bit about that. So an element is a way for your code to hand off requirements to React. So it tells, this is the way that it tells React what needs to be displayed. So following our analogy, it's kind of like a little note card. An element's like a little note card that has a few notes about what React needs to build. It has the type, and it has the props and the children. <clears throat> so this type is the component that's going to be used when React builds the thing. But what thing is it that React builds? What it builds using this note card, using these requirements, is an instance of that component. So the instance is a thing that holds on to state and refs, and that actually helps React figure out what it needs to change in the DOM. But you don't have to manage instances. You don't have to create instance, instances manually. You don't have to figure out how to make sure that they're all deleted at the right time. React handles that for you. So your code asks for an element. React creates it. Then your code tells React to start rendering that element into the container. And this begins construction of React's render tree. And if you don't follow, I'm going to have to move through this pretty quickly. But this is being recorded. And I also have a larger zoomable version of this. If you go to Code Cartoons on Twitter, um, you can find a version of this diagram if you want to follow along. And before I jump into going through this algorithm, I should say this algorithm has changed. It actually has changed since I started writing this talk. And it's going to change again. Um, the folks uh, on the React team are actually working on a vastly different version of the rendering algorithm. If that lands, then this is going to be very different. But as of right now, this is how it works. So React starts by creating this thing called a top-level wrapper. And that's just a little implementation detail, and it's actually probably going away pretty soon. Um, it helps React just group things together. So it creates an instance for this top-level wrapper, and it's wired up that instance to render to the list element that we passed into it. And so then React creates an instance of the list and sets the props and the state on that. And then it wants to create the corresponding DOM for that list. But it doesn't know how. Now, if this list, if instead of passing it a list element, we passed it a React div element, it would know what HTML element it needs to make because you know, there's a one-to-one -one mapping there. It actually knows what a div should correspond to in the DOM. But since we wrote this component, it doesn't know. So it's going to have to ask the component using render. And list responds with the elements that it needs React to create. So it says, OK, I'm going to need you to create a button. And take this.state.items, which is an array, and create an item for each of those things. And wrap all of that with a div element. So React creates those elements. It doesn't care that it doesn't know what DOM it needs to create for things like item. It just creates those note cards, tucks them away, and pulls out the one that it does care about, which is the wrapping element. It's that div element. Because that's going to be the parent of the others. So it creates the instance for that. And it knows what DOM it needs to create for that. Again, because you know it knows if it's a div react element, that that corresponds to a div in HTML. So it creates the DOM for that, too. Now note, it didn't make the div a child of the app container, because that would have, started, uh, that would have scheduled that reflow. What we want to do is have all of our nodes there in the DOM before we schedule that reflow. So now, in order to do that, it's going to need to go through and create all the children. And for that, it goes from a complex to a simple structure. So we had this nested array of children. Um, you know, we had the button and then an array of items. What React does is it flattens the structure. So it goes to an object. And the way that it maintains that hierarchy is actually to use property names. So the property name for button is dot zero because it was the zeroth item in that array. The property names for the items are nested because they were in a nested array. So dot one dot zero is the first item, dot one dot one is the second, et cetera. 
So React takes this flattened list and then creates the instances for it. And those names, those property names, are actually going to become important later on. So just remember that. So now it's time to make the DOM elements for all of these instances. For button, it's easy. Once again, it knows what a button should be. But then it gets the item, and it has to ask again, because item is one of those ones that we wrote. And so item responds, OK, I need you to create a div and use the property that was passed in to me as the text content of that div. So React creates the div element and the instance for it. And then it goes over and creates the DOM node, too. And it does this twice more to give us that full set of DOM nodes that we need in order to render. Then it goes over, and it starts doing all of the connections it needs to. It connects those children to their parent, connects the parent up to the container, and this is what triggers that reflow. But you'll notice that I waited until the end to trigger it. So this is the way that the main thread can handle all those changes together. And so the UI is rendered. That's the initial render. Now the UI is ready for the user. It's ready for those updates that we, we were talking about earlier. Let's see how the virtual DOM handles a user interaction. So the user clicks the button. What happens here? React figures out the on-click handler for that click. And to do this, it uses something called event delegation. I don't have time, unfortunately, to go into what event delegation is. But if you want to learn more about event delegation, they actually do describe it in the docs, the React docs. So it calls the handler. And the handler would be some code like this. You'd get the list of items from the state, perform operations on the items, then call set state with the items. And if you think that you see a possible bug in this code, we're going to get to that later. So the handler would have been defined on the list instance, which created the button element. And it would have been bound to that list instance so that the handler could you know, figure out this.state and all that kind of stuff. So when it calls this.setState, it calls setState on the list instance itself. What happens when setState is called? It doesn't actually make the update immediately. What it does is it takes that partial state that was passed into it for the instance and attaches it to the instance on something called the pending state array. And then from there, it puts the instance on something called the journey components array. And so it's just going to let that array sit there on the dirty components. Uh, it's going to let the dirty components array sit there, that list sit there on that, um, in that queue. And it's going to see if there might be other effects that this click had, if there might be other set state calls that are going to impact the state in React. And if the click has caused other changes, those are also going to be queued up. Then once it's gone through and checked and queued up all of those changes, then it's going to go and flush that queue. And we only have the one thing on the queue, the list instance. So we're just going to process the changes for that. So we start at the instance that had set state called on it, which is the list. And we work down from there. I'm just going to gray out everything that we did in the previous iteration. React does hold on to all of the old stuff because it needs to do comparisons. So we start with the list. React calculates the next state and props, sets them on the instance, and then asks the list instance what it should render to now that it has this new information. And so the instance, or the, sorry, the list tells it the new elements that it should create, and React creates those elements, and then updates the children instances and compares the previous instances to the new ones. So it figures out from there whether or not it needs to make DOM changes. Now, the button didn't change, so it doesn't need to do anything for the DOM. Then it gets to the first item, and it has to ask the item, OK, now that you have this new information, do you need to render anything different? And so the item, uh, it updates the instance for the item. It updates the element, and then updates the instance. And if you'll remember, the, I, the first item in list, the previous list, was one. The first element in the next list is one. So it doesn't actually need to change anything. It figures it can save a little bit of work. It doesn't actually make any changes to the DOM, because the value didn't change. 
Then it gets to the second item, and it goes through that same process. It creates the new element for the second item and updates the instance. Now this time, we're going from two to four, so that is a change. So it actually goes over and makes that change in the DOM. And then it does this a third time for the third number. Because these happened pretty close in time, there's a good chance they happened on the same reflow. So that's how React makes things faster. It figures out the smallest number of DOM changes that it needs to make to the DOM and batches them all together so that the browser can do a smaller number of reflows. But there's still a good amount of work happening here. So how can you reduce that? You know, there's this work happening in JavaScript to maintain, figure out this uh, virtual DOM. How can we actually reduce the amount of work that we're doing there? So this brings us to the third part of the talk. And this is about techniques that you can use to make React faster than that. And the first technique is one that you are probably already aware of if you're using React. And that's because React yells at you and tells you to do it. Whenever you're creating an array of children using map or something like that, it's going to tell you that you should be using keys for those children. So I want to explain to you why keys might have a performance impact on your app. I'm going to need to change up my example that I'm using to something that really highlights when keys are effective. So we're going to have a list of fruits, and when you click the reverse order button, it's going to change the order. And so we're going to go orange, banana, apple instead of apple, banana, orange. And I'm going to jump forward to the part that gets really interesting in this example. So we're in the set state process. We've called set state. We've hit, clicked that button, called set state. This is where React is dealing with the children. So you'll remember where it flattened them before. We went from having this nested array to having this object, and we had the property names that reflected the structure. What React did from here is it compared the old instances to the new ones. And the way that it did that was it used the property names. So let's take a closer look at how it uses the property names to figure out the, you know, new the old list and the new list. So React is going to dig down and see, you know, dot one, dot zero in one list and dot one, dot zero in the other list. And it's going to compare those two. The problem here is that because we've reversed the order, we are literally comparing apples to oranges here. Because <laughs> you know, orange was at the bottom of the list before, now it's at the top. So when it compares these two lists, it thinks that it needs to make changes to every single item except for the middle one, because everything looks different. Now let's say that we had given React meaningful names to use let's say, the actual name of the fruit. Then React could dig deeper and actually figure out which item corresponds to the other. So this is what keys do. When you give React a key, it's going to use that in the property name. So it can actually identify what in the previous list is equal to what in the next list. And so React can figure out from here, oh, this list has just been reordered. And it can just go over to the DOM and reorder those nodes. Now, in this case, it's not a huge difference. But just imagine if each of these items in the list was a complex DOM structure in and of itself. You could have a real time savings by doing things this way. But it's only going to be really an impact. It's only really going to give you a time savings if you're reordering the list. You know, if you are reversing the order or taking items out of the top or the middle of the list. If you aren't changing those array keys, then there's no real performance impact to this. So this is one of the reasons why it's important to understand the why behind a recommendation. Because recommendations don't always give you the same impact in every situation. So let's take a look at a use case where keys would not have an impact, but where another thing that you can do in React would. So this is a list where new items are being fetched from a server and added to the end of the list. So you click the button. And there's no new messages. Now, we had to go through this whole process of building out the render tree, you know, calculating the elements, updating the instances, even though nothing needed to change in the DOM. So this process, where you're making all these updates to the virtual DOM, but not actually changing something in the actual DOM, that's called wasted time. And you can see it in React perf tools. 
So how can you avoid wasting time like this? Now, I'm absolutely sure you've heard of one way if you've been working with React, and that's should component update. The way that this works is that when the user clicks and this.setState is called, React just asks, before it starts rendering anything below the list, it will say, hey, here's the new state and props. Do you need to actually update? And the component says no, so React doesn't call render, doesn't actually do any of that extra work. And this is great because we can skip computing the list and everything under it. So we have all of this work that we saved. But if you looked closely at this should component update, you might have noticed another potential bug. And this ties into the potential bug I talked about earlier in the presentation when we were looking at the click handler. So it depends on how you're going to update the state. So let's say that you were updating it this way. You know, you set a new variable, next items, to this.state.items. And then you pushed an item on the array. And then you called set state with the new variable. What would happen if you did it this way and used a should component update is that you'd never see any new items that were added to that list. Your should component update would always return false. So why is this? It's because even though you have two names for this thing, they're both pointing at the same object. So they're equal because they're just different names for the same exact thing. You know, that's, that's actually how equal works in JavaScript when you're working with objects. This actually just checks if they are referring to the same thing. So even though you make the change, you added that item to the array, the should component update is going to think that the old state and the new state are the same thing. So it's not going to see this change. Now you could make it so that every time you're doing this, you make a new object for the next state, you know, for the next items. And then your should component update would see that things had changed because the previous items and the next items, they point to different objects. The problem is, though, that would always think that something had changed, even if it hadn't. So it would never return false, and you wouldn't get that savings that we were talking about before. Now, one thing that you can do is a deep equality check, you know, where you compare the actual values. You, you go down deeper into the array or the object and compare the actual values of those things. But depending on how heavy that calculation is, it might actually take you more time to do that check. So it'd be nice to have that simple, quick equals check, but still catch changes to the data when they happen. And that is what immutability gives you. So with immutable data, if two variables point to the same object, you know that the data hasn't changed. If it does need to change, you're going to create a new object. So you're, if you're using immutable data, you can do these quick, simple equality checks in should component update. And then you can get this time savings that we were talking about before. So you short circuit work below the thing that you clicked on. But what if the thing that you're clicking on is actually lower in the tree? What if you're actually changing something that's lower than the list? Do you still need to compute this whole tree in order to catch that change? So let's walk through that case. So a good example of this is a to-do list. You know, you click on one thing, and it only changes that one item. It doesn't actually change the list itself, really, or any of the other items in the list. So how can you avoid doing all of the work for those computing the tree for all of those other things? Now, when you're just using vanilla React, it's actually pretty easy. You know, if, you've, if you're using um, local component state, all you have to do is call this.setState on the lower item. And that is just going to only add that one instance to the dirty components array. It's not going to add the parent or the other siblings. But if you're using something like Redux, this can be trickier to do. That's because you're firing off actions in Redux. And that is updating this global state. And the way that you're getting the updates from that global state is by using something called connect. Um, you have a connected component, which actually pulls those in. And a lot of people will connect at the top of the tree and then just pass the props down to all of the children. But there is a way, you know, so that will actually make the, the whole tree think that it needs to change. But there is a way to do it, even if you're using Redux, to have these changes happen at a lower um, part of the tree. 
and that's to use connect at lower levels in the tree. But in order for this to work, you're probably going to need to rethink the way that you're handling state as well. So the way that a lot of people will handle state is passing in the array of items. And then you just pass the item, each item down, to the component that handles it. If you need to change one of these items, though, you're going to need to change the item not just in the component itself, but also in the parent. So how could we make it so that we can just change the data in the item itself? Well, if you have IDs, and then you pass those IDs down, you can use the um, map state to props. And that will convert the ID to an item. So this means that even if the item changes, you don't actually have to change the list, the props going into list itself, because the ID stays the same. It's only the item itself that's changing. And so you'll only trigger for the, the list item itself, not for the list. So this means that you can save work at higher levels of the tree. Now, before you run off, a lot of people have run off from this talk and been really excited about this idea. There is a, another performance impact. Uh, for every item that you have connected, it actually adds a listener. Uh, Redux adds a listener. So you really want to test these things out to make sure that you're not actually making your performance worse. Don't just follow it because it looks cool on the, on the page. Make sure that you test it. Um, after you try this out. So I wish I had time to cover other performance tricks. There are other things that you can do. Um, there's this thing called memoization, where when you do a complex calculation, then you can save that calculation for later, so that if, the same, um, <clears throat> if you have the same arguments coming in, you don't need to do that calculation again. Um, there's also virtualization, where you only show the things that are actually in the page at the time and maybe some stuff that's a little above and a little below if you have like a scrolling list. That can save time. Um, there's the new algorithm uh, that they're working on for React. And there's also things like how you can use observables. Um, tools like MobX and Relay, and I think Vue.js uh, too is actually moving towards using observables. Basically, this gives you a more precise way to let components know when the data has changed. But unfortunately, this is going to have to be it for now. So here are the techniques that we did cover. Uh, the first one is using keys to help React match previous instances to new ones. So this is if you're reordering a list, making sure that it doesn't think that the whole list has changed. The second one is uh, using should component update to short circuit work lower in the tree, and how immutability factors into that. And then the third one is how you can use set state or connect lower in the tree so that you can reduce the amount of work done higher in the tree. So I hope that this has given you a good overview of a few starting points. As you can see, there are lots of different things that you can tweak. Some of them are right for certain cases and some are right for others. This is why people say you should measure any of your changes that you're making when you're doing performance work. And I hope that this talk has given you a good framework to understand what you're measuring when you do that. So thank you very much.